Well, it certainly seems that vintage arcade games are making a comeback this year. Because, well, you have Arcade 1UP making their full-size replicas, you have Numskull with their 17-inch line, New Wave Toys with their 12-inch line, My Arcade with their tabletop versions, and lastly, Super Impulse with their little mini keychain line. So no matter what your poison, you can now get your full arcade experience delivered to you in any size. And since I talked about the Ninja Turtles arcade game last time, I thought for this video it'd be kind of fun to reminisce about some of the arcade games that I grew up with. So today, we're going to be talking about arcade ports and comparing them to their arcade game counterparts. Starting with good old Pac-Man. Today's episode is brought to you by Super Rare Games, which takes previously unreleased hit Nintendo Switch games and turns them into collector editions. And each game they release comes with a really cool colorful collector's guide booklet that tells you how to get through the game. And other editions have included musical CDs of the soundtrack, a full set of playing cards, stickers, pins, and more. So make sure you head on over to superraregames.com to check out their monthly releases that sell out pretty darn quick. When Pac-Man was released in 1980, that little yellow pie slice chomper dominated arcades everywhere. Now this game might seem passe by today's standards, but back in 1980, all the best that the video game world had to offer us were games like Breakout, Space Invaders, and Galaxian. So when Pac-Man came along, well that fun maze-like gameplay revolutionized the industry. And besides that groundbreaking formula of chasing ghosts, only when they turned blue, well, this was also the very first video game that brought us an original video game mascot for us to play as. Because prior to Pac-Man, video games allowed you to play as generic cowboys, blocky characters, starships, pong balls, and whatever the hell this is supposed to be. But with Pac-Man, they gave us an actual character to play as. And of course, any game that exploded onto the scene back in those days was eventually approached by Atari so they could port that thing to their VCS. Unfortunately, the limitations of this console at the time wouldn't be able to support a game that looked like this, so they ended up creating a Pac-Man game that looked like, uh, this. Uh, yeah. I know this game is something left to be desired, but eh, let's just give this a chance. I mean, we still get to chase Gus around the screen and collect those little power pellets. And if we manage to eat those big power pellets, we could then chase after those ghosts. And now, hmm, are these ghosts still edible right now? I can't even tell the difference. Well, that pretty much wrinkles my shit. For a game only involving two different characters on screen, one of which just happens to glitch out the entire game, is pretty damn bad. Sometimes they overlap, sometimes they blink out, or even teleport completely off the screen without warning. What the hell am I playing here? Now, I know a lot of online gamers have ripped this thing more assholes than a public restroom sees daily, but here again is another game where that Phantom Menace effect that I talked about in the last episode comes into play. Because while growing up, I didn't hear one person complain about this game. And sure, it was full of shit, but everyone just accepted that this was the inferior version of Pac-Man. If you wanted to play the original, then you had to get your ass to the arcade and play it. And if you wanted that better version of Pac-Man, well, you needed to upgrade to the Atari 5200. Yeah, now that's more like it. Although the aspect ratio is totally off on this game, to the point where I just have this insatiable need to squish this shit back into place. Alright, there we go. Once you do that, well, it turns out to be a pretty decent port. But of course, now all the sprites are squished to hell. Ah, oh, well, I guess I can live with that. I mean, this version is pretty faithful, right down to the ghosts being red, pink, green. Green? What bastion of hell created this demonic asswipe of the game? Let's look at that. Fuck this game. Get this out of my face. Because I'm willing to wait a couple more years until this thing was ported to the NES, despite the, uh, the whole Tengen battle thing. And once stirring this one up, well, we see that this game is just what Dr. Mario ordered. The aspect ratio is perfect, it sounds great, and it looks great as well. The only downside is that some of the reds and blue colors are a bit flat when compared to the original. But this game is so perfect, it's something I'm willing to overlook. Now, if we switch gears from Pac-Man to Donkey Kong, well, we see a similar evolution taking place here. 
Donkey Kong for the arcade is iconic, yes, but Donkey Kong for the Atari 2600? Uh, what in the holy mother of fucking stun is this? No, 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 no. Ever been to an all-you-can-eat buffet and see someone took a shit in the refried beans? Because this is that game. A bunch of shitty beans. But if we take a look at the Donkey Kong version on the Atari 7800, well, now we're getting ourselves some shit free refried beans. Because this game looks and feels just like that original. And even though this is a great port, well, things got even better when the NES came along because Nintendo was finally able to deliver a perfect Donkey Kong video game. The only thing that was missing was that conveyor belt level, which, uh... Ah, damn it. Ah, just scratch what I just said. Man, we were so close, too. Now, I love me some burger time, but if you're gonna serve me up some burger time for the Atari, I'm gonna shove that ass bird right back in your face. Now, the original video game was just awesome. Running around making hamburgers? Perfect! But when they ported this thing to the Atari... Oh, for crying out loud. This eyesore of a game has so much ass coming out of it, this is the first eyesore that becomes an assore. I mean, just look at this garbage. Egg enemies have become stick figures. And how the hell do you mess up the sausage enemies? One of them looks like an actual sausage, where the other one looks like a dick. Ugh, get this ass burger off my screen. So by now, you're probably seeing the common theme unfolding where graphics in the arcade games are always light years ahead of what can be achieved on home consoles. And as long as the arcades can maintain that technological curve, they're able to thrive. Once home gaming graphics finally caught up to the graphics found in the arcade during the 1990s, well, that's when the arcade scene started to be killed off because why go to the arcade when you can just play the exact same game at home? Like take Pac-Mania for instance. Seeing Pac-Man run around in a Legoland level didn't go unnoticed by me as a kid, because I love both Pac-Man and Lego. So when I saw the NES port of this game finally released at my local video game rental store, I was super excited. But when I finally sat down to play it, ah damn it all, they turned Pac-Mania into a pack pile of porcupine piss. Because half the game's charm was the awesome graphics where it was given a cartoony cell shaded look. And with the NES version, well, they stripped all that away into a downgraded dumpster fire. But if you think that's bad, we'll just check out this shit when we switch gears to another gaming franchise done in by console limitations, Dragon's Lair. Dragon's Lair was the coolest damn game when I saw this in arcades. A game that played like an actual cartoon? Like what? To say this game was revolutionary is an understatement because I hovered around this damn game for hours until someone finally good at this thing would finally come along and would finally get to those later stages where we could see those levels like with the balls in the corridor. Man, that was freaking awesome. And of course, when I played this game, I sucked at it because it was one of those games where you had to press the right button at the right time or you'll just keep dying over and over again. So, yeah, <laughs> if I wanted to see this game, I had to wait till somebody awesome at this came along. But oddly enough, some dummy came along and thought they could actually port this game that looked like an actual cartoon to the NES and do it justice. And as a dumb kid, well, I bought into this thing, hook, line, and sinker. Because if you look at the NES cover, well, it has all that iconic cartoony imagery. So I thought, hey, this has to be the same game, right? Well, this 8-bit bent boner bastard of a game not only looked terrible, but they also replicated the exact gameplay of needing to hit the right button at the right time bullshit. Uh. Shit! Damn it! <laughs> now come on! This is only the first part in level one! I can't imagine what the hell the last level is like because that hitting the right button at the right time mechanic just doesn't work for this game. Uh. <sighs> now you could say, oh, Irate Gamer, this could have worked if it was a side-scrolling adventure game. Well, no, it wouldn't because, well, they did that with the SNES version. I mean, even though the graphics are upgraded, well, this turns out to be another bumble fuck of a game that I just want to chuck into the nearest wood chipper. They put so many stupid obstacles in this game to avoid that it becomes a literal countdown to see how fast you can die. Which isn't that long, apparently. And even if you graduate to the Sega CD version, you might think, hey, the original arcade game was on a laser disc. This could work. Well, slow down there, Chief. Because yes, we do finally get a small taste of what Dragon's Lair could be like in the comfort of your own home. 
But again, we have those damn graphical limitations. Ugh, the compression method used on this video is absolutely horrid. I think I get better print quality on my dot matrix printer from the 1990s. Oh, and uh, the controls suck too. Ugh, I just can't win. And of course, we had to wait 20 years until this thing was ported onto the PlayStation to get the exact arcade feel that we were looking for. Boy, talk about a long 20 years. Now, thankfully, not all the games that were ported onto the NES suffered from those hardware limitations. But instead, the biggest drawback of the first batch of arcade games ported to the Nintendo was that they gave us such faithful recreations of these games, they only gave us three lives to complete the game and no continues. These morons all overlooked the simple fact that you couldn't just dump a quarter into the console whenever the game was over. What the hell's up with that? No continues, no bonus lives, nothing. Just pack your shit and go home. Talk about killing off any replayability these games had. Especially with that unholy mother of fuck game called Ghost and Goblins. 35 years later and this game still sends me over the edge. And this game is so hard, I dare anyone to even get off that first level. And of course after dying, the stupid game mocks you with that staged startup screen, showing you all those later levels that you'll never even get to see. <laughs> Over 40 years later, an irate gamer still can't beat me! Oh, you asshole! <laughs> oh, and I have to give up smoking. I mean, what the hell is the point of creating an entire game if no one can even reach the second level? Well, thankfully, this three lives and no continues nonsense ended up getting resolved when the next batch of video games were released for the console, like Akari Warriors and Contra. Because it was these games that started embedding secret codes into them that helped gamers play even further than you ever could otherwise. Oh, thank God for that. And speaking of Contra, well, back in the day, I had no idea this was based off an arcade game. But yep, it was. And even though the arcade version was vastly superior in the graphics department, well, somehow, the NES version turned out to be a much better game. Huh? How the hell did that happen? Well, you'd think it'd be the other way around, but nope, it didn't. And it was because Konami went the extra mile by making the levels longer, easier, and even adding in extra ones to the game by really ramping up the playability and having that home video game player in mind. So what we ended up with was a pretty awesome Contra game. And whatever they did seemed to work because this trend also continued into other video games like Paperboy. The original arcade game had some of the best graphics around at the time, and they were far superior to the NES version. And of course, when they ported this to the NES, they reworked this to the point where Paperboy is actually the superior game. Because when we look at the arcade game, well, the pace of this one is super fast, causing the player to crash almost as soon as you started the game. Damn it. As for the NES version, well, they slowed things down a bit, so you can at least get through the paper out for the day. And the same thing happened with Spy Hunter. The arcade game had superior graphics, but man, was it a fast-paced game. With the NES version, well, they slowed things down a bit again, and the levels were extended to offer up a lot of replayability. Ah! But if you want the best example of an NES game outshining the arcade game, well, it has to be Punch-Out. Now, I spent half my childhood playing this damn game because well, it was so well made. But when I saw the game punch out in the arcade, well, I kept having to do a double take because I wasn't even sure if this was the same game or not. I mean, this one was a complete departure from the NES version. It clearly had the same name, some of the same fighters like Glass Joe, but the playable character of Mac was this weird wireframe dude, the camera angle was off, and you had all these unrecognizable new fighters they had to fight through. So even though there was an arcade version, well, I wanted no part of it. Just give me the NES version, and I'll be a happy camper. But of course, for every good game that outshone the original, well, we had about a thousand others that stunk like a leaky asshole. Now let's take the video game Bad Dudes, for instance. This was an arcade game I just loved. I used to love playing this rare two-player arcade game with my cousin at the local pizzeria we had. And it was really hard to find two-player games back then, so when I found this game, it was just awesome. So when I went to the local video game rental store and saw they ported this game to the NES, I was super excited. We got this game home, popped it in. Yes, same level, same fighters, and a two player game mode that allowed you to play one player at a time. Oh, what the fuck? Why did they go and change the best feature of this game? You couldn't figure out a way to give us both players playing at the same time. 
Just lazy. Well, at least it wasn't as bad as the Indiana Jones and the Temple of Doom port. My god, this game was an absolute basket of assholes. Little did I realize that this too was originally an arcade game, which really wasn't all that bad. But here again, we find the company taking a mediocre game and trying to stitch more game elements into it. They have no sense even being in this game in the first place to give us one piece of shit port full of something that has 40 fucking levels in? Like, really? Do we really need that many goddamn levels? Ah, Temple of Doom, you're a temple of ass! Ah! Now thankfully when we start getting up into the era where Mortal Kombat was released, we find the consoles at the time, well, ported this game pretty darn well. And when it came to the Super Nintendo and Sega Genesis ports, they could replicate the game about 95% of the way there. Well, both versions delivered a pretty close game. The only thing really off was the graphics were downgraded slightly and they gave us a different aspect ratio. And even if we look at the Sega CD version, which was probably the most faithful version out there at the time, well, even they had to scale the graphics back a bit to bring this classic to the console. But of course, this game was so close to the original, it's kind of pointless to even rant about it. So in the end, as you can see, we got some great ports and, well, not so great ports. And every one of those games ended up shaping or scarring my childhood. Well, anyway, here's a game they never did port, Star Wars, and of course, it's because of this crazy joystick. And since they never did, well, I'm gonna go ahead and play this. So, thanks for watching, I'll see you next time. Yeah, I'll shove that force right up your ass!